<laughs> Hi, Taylor. Okay. Hi, Hillary. Hi, Hillary. <laughs> Taylor, why don't you tell Hillary what you do so she knows who you are? Do you want to tell, tell us what you do? Because I don't actually know what you do either. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I am the partner support manager for the Bay Area chapter, so I handle um, it, a big part of it is scheduling the workshops for the partners and making sure that they get access to all of our resources. Um, yeah, that's that's the majority of it. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Taylor would schedule the partners and Sean would schedule the the trainers. Is that how that works? No, I sell the sell the partners and then Taylor schedules it and then Sonia assigns them. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> We don't have anybody like you on the East Coast, like all that system out there. But it is nice. It's nice for um, Sean and Taylor to be on here because they get to know a little bit about you, and and you're kind of what they're selling. So <laughs> it's good for them to get to see you and and meet you. That's really what it is. More of a, a way for them to kind of get an idea of who you are. So all right. Well, we we'll get started whenever you are ready. Um, you know, feel free to get started. All right. Guys, welcome. Thank you so much for taking your time out to be here tonight. I know you all have hectic schedules and families and teams you could be with right now, but I appreciate you making this a priority. We're happy to have you. Um, my name is Hillary Bach. I am born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Anybody ever out there ever had the pleasure of stopping through Tulsa, Oklahoma? Not too... Oh, one taker! Wow. <laughs> it always interests me. Why? why? Why were you there? I'm not sure why I was there, but I do know that I was very fortunate to grow up in a, a program and a family where sports was a priority and so grateful for all the gifts and talents that it's offered in my in my time. Um, a little bit about myself and my career. I grew up playing softball, basketball, and volleyball. Got recruited to play softball at Arizona State University. That's in Tempe, Arizona, right outside of Phoenix. Um, from there, I had the pleasure of competing in the Women's College World Series for three out of the four years and walking away with the national championship, something I could never have imagined that would happen, but something I'll never forget. From there, I was drafted to the Akron Racers, played professional ball for two seasons in Ohio, and then recruited to play overseas in Japan. So I spent two seasons over in Japan. But that's enough about me. I'm currently in the Pac-12 Conference and still coaching on the side. Love what I do. But I want to make this an interactive session. I've told you a little bit about me. I want to learn a little bit more about you. So can we pull the audience? I'd love to see what sports we have represented tonight. Do I have... Do I have any basketball coaches out there? Any basketball? Golf? Tennis? What am I missing? Volleyball. Volleyball, okay. Lacrosse. Lacrosse. Okay, swimming, diving. Wow, what, quite a collection. Okay, well, that, well, I'm glad you're here. And I want you to know that I'm here tonight to share PCA's mission with you. I was uh, coaching in Phoenix, and I was complaining to one of my favorite mentors, and I was just so frustrated that all of my student athletes were coming in and they wanted trophies and they're like, coach, the trophies. Like, I'm not, I am all about trophies and I completely believe in the prize of winning when you create success. You, you should get rewarded for that, but giving everyone a trophy was something that was such a burden on my heart. And she was telling me about PCA and she was like, Hillary, you have got to get involved. And I was like, I'm all about the positive attitude. Um, but I want I want to win. Like I want to be with winners. I, I can't go learn about. And she's like, No, this is the best part. And that's how I first got involved with PCA. It's a performance-driven workshop. I'm here to help you make your student athletes better. And that's what we're going to hear today. We're going to create better athletes, which make better people. So I want to make you uncomfortable a little bit more. I need everyone to stand up. And I want you to go stand by someone. Go sit by someone you've never met before. I want you to sit next to someone. You don't know their name, and go go find a new friend. Okay, so then everybody stands up and then move <laughs> <coughs> Perfect. All right, now I want you to take a minute. You have a new friend to your side. I want you to take a minute and talk to your partner about an influential coach you've had in your life. Tell me someone who's changed your life. Ready, set, go. All right, so then I'm going to give them three to five minutes for that. Do you want to pause now to calculate that time or just keep going? I think you should hear our answers, just because okay. sometimes it's good to see how you can field um, field answers. Maybe not all yeah. of us, but you know, maybe one okay. or two. So that was the plan. They talk to their partner, and then they come back to me, and I say, "Great guys, and it sounds like we've had a lot of really positive discussion. Would anyone like to stand up for the group and give us an example? Tell tell me about a life changing coach you've had. Who's willing to share with the group? I, I'm willing. Oh, thanks, Yeah. Um, 
Well, you know, I think the coach that had the biggest influence on me and uh, changed my life the most is a guy by the name of Sal Rodriguez who coached me in, in many sports at the local boys club. It's now the Boys and Girls Club of Goleta. Back then it was just the boys club. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I think he, through sports coaching, uh, influenced my life a lot. That's, oh gosh, that's so great to hear. I love, I love it so much. A long time ago, it's it's fun to see how much you were impacted at such a young age. Well, anyone uh, else? Anyone yeah. else wanting to share? I had I had a coach that influenced me. It was my field hockey coach in high school, and she believed. I would say she was kind of a win at all cost coach, and every practice was about pitting one player against the other, oh. and. She really pushed us to the limit. I mean, we literally ran until we couldn't stand up anymore, and whoever was still standing got to start in the game. And used a lot of a lot of um, scare tactics and fear. And if you made a mistake, she ripped us out of the game. And I decided when I graduated from high school that I wanted to be the complete opposite of the way that coach was. Wow, and Kelly, you know what? That's a great example of how we can learn from both the good and the bad. I appreciate you bringing that up because. Not every coach is going to be a great one, but it's a great opportunity to learn. I appreciate the silver lining you've put on top of that. That's a great example. So tonight we're here to help you guys become those coaches. I know you've already started that path, and you're already affecting lives. Maybe you don't even know how many lives you've affected. But I want to teach you a little bit about the PCA mission and what we call emotional takes. Right? So uh, have you ever been in a situation, walk with me through this, where you've planned the perfect practice? You cannot mess this up. You've got it all planned out. Everyone's choreographed. The rotations are right. You've thought of the most incredible drills. And you're pumped. You're excited for practice. And you get out there, not 10 minutes later, and nothing's going right. You've got student athletes everywhere, dropped balls. It, it's just a mess. What do you do? What do you see in those athletes? How frustrating is that? So that's what we call in the PCA is the emotional tank. When their tanks are empty, they're not performing, just like if you're in a car. If your gas tank is empty, you're not going anywhere. So can anyone tell me um, what it looks like if a student athlete's tank is full? Can it, what, what, what do you see in a student athlete when their tank is full? They're confidence. playing with more confidence. Oh, Ruben. <laughs> confidence, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Just excited to be there. Yeah. What, what about their body language? What do you see in their, their face or their, or their body? Happy to be there. Good. Good. I always say they're like my eager puppies. They you know, they're just like wagging their tail and ready to go, and whatever you say, they're like, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. Uh, I mean, how many of you guys out there would want to coach a team where everyone's excited to be there, with a whole bunch of puppies who want to get better? Sign me up for that, right? Yeah. But that's not always the case. And what are some things that could have happened that day before you even get to see these student athletes? Now they come in with empty tanks. What are what are some things that could cause an empty tank? Any ideas? I mean, these these girls and boys are going through high school and middle school. I can't. That was rough for me. What are some things that caused those bad days? They got dumped. <laughs> Ooh, rough. <laughs> Sitting in a classroom at a desk for six hours. Absolutely. Maybe they got in a fight with a sibling that day. Yeah. Or parents, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, as coaches, um, one of our jobs is to provide that positive and negative. There's going to be criticism. And coach is naturally going to decrease a tank. Um, but here today, we're learning about how we can fill those tanks, because that's how we're going to get our student athletes to perform better. Now, I've got a fun example. Do I have any baseball fans out there? I'm looking for a pitcher. Oh, wow, so many hands shut up. All right, Ruben, will you be my pitcher? Yes. Oh, perfect. Okay, and I've got this squishy ball. Here's your ball. Okay, no, nothing too fragile around here, so you're going to take the ball. Where's my home run hitter? Who's going to knock one out of the park off Ruben? Oh, there we go. All right. Taylor, you're up. Here's the bat. Okay, now, Ruben, I want you to wind up with the best heat you've thrown all day. Taylor, you've got your big stick. You're knocking, you're making contact on this pitch, okay? And fans, I need my fans in the stands to get loud. We've got to support Taylor. So when she does something great, I want to hear about it. Tell me all the great things Taylor's doing, okay? Ready, Ruben? Yep. Pitch. Fans, where are we at? Woo! Way to go, way to go, way to go. Taylor, yeah. Woo! 
Yeah. Nice swing, Taylor. Yo, Tim, how are you feeling? Feeling really great. Feeling good about that. <laughs> what did you notice from the fans? What what kind of feedback were you getting there? Really positive, upbeat feedback. Um, I mean, Kelly had some nice specific praise that she gave me with nice swing, so I feel, feel good. Great. Ruben, that was a nice pitch. I think you have another one in your tank, so let's let's see another fastball from Ruben. Maybe put some spin on it. Taylor, this time I think you may miss the ball, okay? So bottom of the seventh, big inning right here, Taylor whiffs. All right, fans, what do we get when Taylor whiffs? Ruben with the pitch. Oh. Oh, no. oh. Um, get out of here. Um. Oh, man, Taylor, what do you think now, sister? I'm not feeling so good. <laughs> How's your tank? Where, where, where are you at emotionally? It's, it's empty. It, I might be on negative right now. It's not <laughs> feeling very good. <laughs> now, do you want to get back in the box and try again? No, I want yeah. the pitch hitter to come out. <laughs> yeah, don't want me to coach, right? The opposite of that. All right, let's give it one more try. Okay, Taylor, I want you to turn around real quick. I'm going to tell the stadium something. All right, fans, here we go. So this time, I'm going to let Taylor take one more swing. She may not have the right success, but I need some positive feedback. Let's give her some positive criticism. We can still fill her tank, even though she hasn't had perfect success. All right, Taylor, come back with us. We've got one more pitch from my all-star, Ruben. Bottom of the seventh, bases are loaded. Oh. Way to be aggressive, Taylor. Hang in there. Keep swinging. Keep time. swinging. Good try. Yeah. Great, Taylor. Tell me where you're at now. What kind of what kind of feedback did you get that time? I got positive feedback. I feel even though I missed, I still feel like they have faith in me and that I can that I can go again. Good. That's what we want to hear. That's absolutely right. So our society is malicious. They're constantly telling us what we did wrong. But we can think of three really good things that Taylor did right. Who can give me three specific things that Taylor can take moving forward? She kept her eye on the ball. Great. Absolutely. She swung all the way through. Yeah, great. Her mechanics were good. <laughs> Perfect. So now Taylor can walk away with those positives and try to get better for next time. Ruben, those were some smoking hot pitches. Way to go. <laughs> nice job. All right, so guys, if we're talking about ratios. We're talking about positives to negatives. What do you think that ratio should be? We're, if you're a practice, how many positives do I need to give to one criticism? Is it one to one, one to three, or one to five? I got some threes of voting. Anybody else? Fingers? One, one, three. Oh, shockingly, guys, I have to be honest, the PCA mission says it's one to five. For every one criticism, you have to give five positive feedbacks. Now, Mark, how many people do you have on your team? 24. 24. So do you think you can give... 24 times 5, can you give that many criticisms in one practice to 24 negatives? 20. It's going to be tough, right? It's going to take a lot of practice if you're sitting around complimenting people all the time. And you're trying to make them better, right? You want to improve. But we, it's important. If your athletes are going to perform, they need to have that full tank. So what are some ideas you guys have? on where we can fill our student-athlete tanks. Does anyone have any good examples on how they do it at their practice? Pound it. Pound it, okay. What I, else? Would say, I would say even when they're not successful, like you had us practice with Taylor, point out the things that she did do well, even though the outcome might not have been a, a hit or a success. That's a, Ruben, that's a great example. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? I do a lot with uh, younger girls learning lacrosse, and I do a lot with uh, follow-through on the shot. So instead of even, I don't even count how many goals go in. I just get, I, we just clap and get excited if their follow-through is pointing where their stick should be pointing rather than it, you know, stopping up here or being down in the air. So for the first couple weeks of practice, we don't even worry about if the ball goes in. That's a great example. It, it probably uh, it takes a little bit of effort on your part, but I appreciate that you're making that effort. Uh, to fill those tanks. One of my favorite examples I ever heard was a coach had a group sit together and tell a positive to a teammate. And so Bobby would say, Bobby, what did you see um, Kevin do well? And Kevin, Kevin did a great layup at practice. And then the coach asked, how many people saw Kevin do that great pass? And so when Ke they put their hand on their head. And so now not only is he getting one, criticism, or one positive feedback from Bobby, 
He's getting seven positive feedbacks from all of his teammates who saw the same thing. That action is kind of reaffirming that seven positives from him. So that's a great thing. The other suggestion I've heard is the PCA criticism sandwich. So it's a positive, some improvement, right, a piece of improvement, and then another positive on the other side, which is also could be ended with a Y. Like, if you do this, it will help you improve in this direction, and that's something that I've taken away in my coaching um, that's really helped me. I have to say, guys, that you have such an impact on these young student-athletes. You probably don't even realize um, how much you're teaching them, but if you can take this one piece away, the Positive Coaching Alliance Criticism Sandwich, the emotional tanks, keeping those positives up, 5 to 1 ratio, um, those are something that will really help you in the future. Don't be afraid to check out the website. Uh, there's a script on there under Coaching Tools where you can uh, take some of that back to your practice. Thank you for your time. Woohoo! Nice job. Thank you. You have two minutes to spare. That's that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. That was great. I had two minutes to spare. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You had two minutes left. I had eight seconds. Sorry. <laughs> I kind of I kind of started it halfway through your intro. Okay. Fair. <laughs> oh, timer. <laughs> oh, there you go. Good for you. All right. How did you feel doing that? Did you? Uh, that's adrenaline. It feels like I'm back on the field again, like ready to go, and I get a little excited. So sometimes I talk fast, and then I, it's it's difficult on the video to wait for you guys to respond. I'm like, come on, like, do something. Let's go. <laughs> All right. I could tell. I'd like to be on your team. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> all right. Um, so if we could just all each go through and just say uh, a positive, something you really liked about Hillary's um, Hillary's workshop. Um, Mark, would you mind starting? Yeah, uh, Hillary, I love your energy. You're, you're right from the get-go. You're very positive and energetic, and you instantly captured um, my attention in within the first 30 seconds of your presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks. Sean, how about you? Uh, yeah, I also love the energy, but in addition to I love the you know real life examples that you used. Um, I think it really helps coaches to relate when when they can hear specific examples being used. Mm -hmm. Good, Taylor. Well, Sean stole mine, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think another. I I mean I loved so much of it. I like that you. Um, Ah, geez. I love that what you had us do was was more engaging, even just having people get up and move and sit next to someone that they've never that they've never spoken to before. It takes a short amount of time, but you still had us up and moving and it gets I think it's a good way to start off a workshop. Mm hmm Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ruben? Um, I liked a lot too. A lot of the things that have already been mentioned. Um, uh, I also like your willingness to um, give that uh, exercise uh, a go with uh, me pitching and Taylor batting and and the group responding. I appreciate uh, you working that in uh, as part of uh, your 15 minute piece. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I just I have a couple things um, that I loved. I, I mean, right off the bat, you were having fun. And if you're having fun, I'm having fun. You were laughing. You were you were giving us a lot of eye contact, and it makes it it makes it enjoyable. You wanna? I mean, my energy level. No offense, my it's it's 8:30 here. My energy level was like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. And after watching you, I'm like, I'm all hyped up too now. Like I'm excited, and that's that's contagious energy, which is really great. Um, yeah. I love first and foremost that you stress the importance of winning, and that we're about performance. And that's huge because right there off the bat, you're going to get the attention of most of the participants. As soon as you say that, like, oh, 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 you're about winning. And then when you couple that on top of the fact that your your athletic history and you've played pro ball and you've played it internationally and you're still coaching, so obviously you are a competitor and you're drawn to PCA for those competitive reasons first, which I think is really cool. That was great that you brought that up. Um, I thought you did the scenario really well and I, I know I've showed you how I do it with basketball but I loved it from a baseball or softball point of view and I love the way you were pumping up Ruben I mean you were just having a good time and I thought that was a lot of fun um, and again I just think that your your choice of words was really good you know you, you seem very easy it, you, it wasn't like you had to stress for words you know you felt like you really understood what was going on even saying something like you know society's malicious these days you know 
That's it's a good word to use because sometimes I they can that from you. That's such a cool word. I, you said it and I was like, wow, malicious. <laughs> I've been I've used it four times this week. There you go, SAT word. Um, <laughs> but I just think I think you did a great job getting us trying different activities, asking us questions, getting us involved. You know, raising your hand, pointing fingers, getting in groups, sitting next to somebody you don't know, and you recognize that it could be awkward for somebody to get up and sit next to somebody you don't know. So that's almost giving us permission to like, okay, I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway because she's making me. You know, it's it's just a very good way to put your audience at ease. I thought you did a really nice job with that. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. All right, now, if, uh, what I'd like to do now is just have everybody go through and just say a wish for Hillary or a suggestion that you might have for her. We're, we're trying to build each other up here, and we're trying to get better, so it always helps to hear the other side of it, too. Um, Mark, do you have a, a suggestion or wish for Hillary? Mm. Um, on the spot, not necessarily. I might have to think about it a little bit. I'm still, I'm still high energy from her presentation, so. <laughs> okay, we can come back to you. Okay. Sean, how about you? Uh, the the one thing, and, and you kind of already I think noticed it is you know maybe slow down a little bit. Um, you know a lot of these coaches sitting there, it, it, a lot of information really really fast. So maybe just you know be a little cognizant, you know slow it down a little bit. And then my suggestion always to new trainers from my a salesman standpoint is when you have the book instead of maybe referencing the website, use the book as a tool and say you know turn to this page and that tool is in your book. Just because we push the books to try and get them included, so when when they are there, it helps me personally a lot when, when they're mentioned. So. Anything for you, Sean. Thanks. <laughs> Taylor, how about you? Um, I guess my only, my only thing is to just to talk slower, especially when it comes to like our, our very specific PCA verbiage, like filling emotional tanks, and you did, um, just, but what I think when you repeat it, make sure to not be like, Filling emotional tanks, but still kind of making sure that they're un that they understand those key terms. Um, yeah. But I mean, I thought it was great. So, all right, Mark, did you think of something? No, uh, Sean kind of jogged my memory a little bit. Um, the the only critique that I could give with that is just slowing down, maybe a touch. And I thought of uh, kind of what Sean was saying: drinking out of a fire hose. I'm trying to pretend that I'm a I'm a participant here. Um, it's a lot of information. It's all accurate. It's all good. But maybe let me digest it just a little bit more. So absolutely. Yep. Good advice, Ruben. Yeah. Yeah. So I I'm gonna I'm my, my uh, top uh, suggestion is very consistent with the others and. Um, you know, I, I think I I really like your energy, and I like, you know, when I've been forced to be here, or it's 7 p.m., and I, you know, um, I love the energy that you bring. I, that that's as a participant, I I want that, and I I think I think that um, I, I think that I, I I hear what the others are saying um, about slowing down a, a, a bit. Um, I think it's okay for most of your workshop or a good chunk of your workshop to be at that level and even the pace that you set, Hillary. And if you combine that with changing the pace, um, again, like some of the other says, others said, when you want to make sure they, they know what um, emotional tank is um, or if there's something you really want to emphasize. Some trainers, when they emphasize, they crank up their energy. I think for you, Hillary, a very powerful tactic will be when you want to emphasize something is to actually scale back, lower your voice, and talk. Um, actually, take some of the 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 um, happiness, joyfulness uh, out of your face, and 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 be serious for just a moment. You know. Um, so anyway, I, I um, we, we have we have many wonderful trainers that have that high energy like you. Kelly is one of them, um, and I, I think it's it's a great great asset. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was gonna say that at first, then I'm like I I was criticized for that many times. I think I told somebody earlier today my very one of my very first workshops. Someone came up to me afterwards and said, I feel like I just got hit by a train. But that was awesome. And I was like, what does that mean? But it was, it was just too much information, too fast, coming, coming, coming. 
And I do have a lot of energy, and my energy probably like yours builds as the night goes on because I get more and more excited. And I've learned over the years that, as Ruben said, sometimes when I just take a deep breath and I'll say, now, did you ever think about that? And people are like, wait a minute, where'd the energy go? She must be serious here. And it, it does. It just changes the kind of changes the tone of, of serious things. Um, I only had two things. Um, the one is I would have liked you to kind of stress a little bit of the research a little bit more. Um, we're a very research-based program, so to throw that in at some point, especially talking about the magic ratio, I think you did a nice job with the magic ratio. But you know, it is research-based. You said it's PCA, PCA's magic ratio, which it is something we've used, but we've actually borrowed it from three other research studies. So sometimes that gives yeah. a little bit more credibility to. Um, you know, Kirkman and Godhart, or Gottman and Kirkhart, whatever you want to say, it's in the book, you can read about the study, but, um, you know, sometimes it just, it's not PCA's study, it's somebody else's magic ratio that we've, we've found very effective in sports as well, you know, that type of a thing. Um, and I was going to say the same thing, uh, using the book, you know, mentioning the book, showing them where the tools are. I'm only going to mention two that I love, the Criticism Sandwich and one other, but if you turn to page 24, you're going to see six other tools that might work better for you on your team. You know, something quick and easy like that that can get them to go, oh, wow, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and, you know, dog ear it, sticky note it, circle it. Whatever. In the very beginning, I always tell people, this is not necessarily a workbook, but I want you to work it. You know, use it, read it. Um, and the only other thing that I had was when you ask people to discuss something in a group, you said like three to five minutes, I probably wouldn't give anyone more than two. Okay. Even if it's a bigger group, because if you give people five minutes, that gives them time to kind of relax. Like, oh, I've got five minutes. So I can talk about your kids first. And, yo, yeah, I like your hair and whatever, you know, and, and how was the game today or whatever. If you say two minutes, it gives more people a sense of urgency. Like, we're going to get together and we've got to talk about this because we only have two minutes. Oh, that's good advice. If it they seems like the discussion is really bubbling and you want to give them three, you know, give them three. But I would only tell them two minutes or so. Okay. Yep, but I thought you did a fantastic job. I was, I'm excited for you. That was great. Thank you so much. Yep, absolutely. All right, Mark, we're all fired up now. <laughs> It'd be hard to follow up on Hillary, so nope. I'll, I'll give it a shot, though. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to set my timer, too. That's why I'm getting close. Okay. All right. Well, Whenever good evening, ready. everybody. Uh, my name is Mark. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Howard, and I am from the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area. And especially for all you Bay Area coaches that traveled all the way to bone-chilling cold Wisconsin just to hear me talk for 15 minutes, thank you very much for coming. So a um, little, little bit about my background. Um, like, uh, just like you, I'm a coach, and I grew up playing youth sports. I played a lot of uh, youth basketball, youth baseball. Um, I played in high school. I was a varsity football player and a varsity lacrosse player as well. And I played at the club level uh, collegiately and even post-collegiately in the Chicago area where I'm originally from. Uh, so I've been around sports for many, many years. Um, I currently am a uh, coaching education program uh, trainer for U.S. lacrosse. been doing that for a few years so I can stay with lacrosse. And also something unique about me is um, I've been in the, I work in the law enforcement field and for about 20 years, I've been a trainer. And one of the things that I've learned about training and coaching uh, is that they're kind of synonymous, is that really what happens is the subject matter may change, what we're actually coaching, what sport we're coaching. Maybe you're baseball or softball, and I'm a lacrosse coach. But the coaching aspect, the training aspect of it, uh, really bonds us all together. So I found that to be very helpful with me as well. So uh, why does that stuff matter? Uh, it matters because, like I said, coaching is coaching. Uh, sports may change, um, but we're all coaches, and I'm a coach just like you. So why am I here? Um, I'm here, honestly. I became a high school coach uh, years ago, and about a year into my venture as a high school coach, um, I was sitting in the same seats that you guys are sitting in right now. Uh, I went to my first double goal coaching clinic, and I sat there waiting for it to start, wondering what's all this about? Uh, is this going to be about being more uh, nicer to people? Is this going to be about everyone's a winner, everyone gets a trophy? I had no idea what this was about. And I learned after that evening uh, that that was not at all what uh, positive coaching lines was about and certainly not what it meant to be a double goal coach. 
at that point I began to learn uh, that by working on becoming a double goal coach, uh, I could win more, I could have a lot more fun while I was coaching, um, I could get more out of my players, more performance. I started to learn a little bit that uh, double goal coaching is about performance. It's performance based, getting more out of our players. And the bonus for me, because I'm a youth level coach right now, is that I could get parents to work with me rather than against me. And parents are a big factor in our coaching. Okay, So basically I began to start using the core principles of the Positive Coaching Alliance and Double Goal Coaching, uh, that being the elm tree of mastery, filling emotional tanks that Hillary just talked about. But what I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes is the root, what we call the roots, which is how we honor the game uh, by showing respect for the roots of the game. So I'll get to that in just a couple minutes here. So success came to me by way of winning a couple of high school state championships here in, in, uh, in high, boys high school lacrosse in Wisconsin. But you know that was secondary because I learned the value of how many life lessons there were to be taught to my high school players that I was coaching and also all of the youth players that I continue to coach today. So with that, Last question before we get to, before we get to roots is why are you here tonight? Why are you all here tonight? Um, obviously, I know the answer to that question is that your organization has chosen, uh, like many other organizations in the United States, to partner with the Positive Coaching Alliance uh, to help fulfill that mission. And the mission is to transform youth sports so that sports can transform youth. So I'm really glad you're here tonight, and I want you to keep in mind that we talk about roots and this is all about changing our mindset as coaches and uh, changing our mindset about how we coach the young athletes that are under our care. So I've been sitting for a couple minutes. Can everybody just stand up for me? I got a little exercise here about mindset. Okay. I'm going to keep time right here and what I would like you to do is for the next 10 seconds I'd like to uh, have you look to the people sitting around you and I want you to treat those people like you couldn't care less about them at all. I'll be the timekeeper. Ready? Go. And time. All right. Pretty quiet. Not a lot going on here. Okay. Now, stay standing. I'm going to change just one factor in this exercise. For the next 10 seconds, I would like all of you to treat the same people around you like you just bumped into a long-lost friend on the street. Okay, ready? And go. Oh, hey. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I didn't know you were going to be here. This is awesome. How are you? Good to gosh. see you. How long has it been? It is so good to see you. Wow. Didn't expect this. What a treat. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks. And time. Okay. So, coaches, what was the difference? What changed? What was the difference? What changed? Our point of view? Your point of view, right. Anybody else, what changed? What did you notice that changed? I noticed my body language changed. I went from being kind of closed off and not wanting to talk to opening myself up and being more vocal. Right, right. You know, yeah, I think both of you are correct. The energy in the room changed. You could, you could see it right away. Um, and that's just a, a real brief example on all I asked you to do was to simply just change your mindset. That's all I did. And you did it. You did a great job. So tonight, it, I just want to show you that it's that easy changing our mindset about how we coach kids. And you can do it with your teams as well. So uh, tonight, I'm going to talk to you for the next few minutes about honoring the game by showing respect through the roots of the game. OK? Now, you can go ahead and sit down again. Uh, your new friends, your new neighbors that you just met a couple minutes ago, I want to give you 30 seconds. Uh-oh. And this is the term sportsmanship. And I would like you to spend 30 seconds, talk to your neighbor, and come up with what is the difference between honoring the game and sportsmanship, or is there even a difference? So I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. Go ahead and talk to your neighbor. Okay, 
And time. All right. Would anybody want to volunteer an answer? I carry candy with me. <laughs> Starburst. Ruben, you're smiling. <laughs> yeah. Um, got any Skittles or Starburst? Um, uh, Mark, um, I, I guess it's a good question, you know, and I, I had to think about it. Um, I guess I would say that sportsmanship uh, sounds like just something that exists, whereas honor the game, honoring the game sounds more uh, action-oriented. That, 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 that would be my stab. I kind of view sportsmanship as on the field, you know, you're a good sport on the field, whereas honoring the game encompasses everything. Mm -hmm. Are you there, Mark? Both of you, but it, but it, um, yeah, I'm here. Okay, I couldn't I hear. I couldn't hear. I, I think Hillary Hillary was responding, but I think she might have been muted. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. I'm talking to myself here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying that sportsmanship to me is almost in the moment and um, being a good sport at the game, and then honoring the game is like a legacy, like what what people will remember you by. Yeah, I, li I like that answer a lot. And, uh, you know, those all three of those were good answers. I'd like to just suggest to all of to everyone here um, that uh, sportsmanship, that term sportsmanship seems to have been given kind of a bad rap in the last few years where uh, really when you mention sportsmanship today, a lot of people see that as just a list of don'ts. Like I have my checklist of things as a coach to not do. Uh, don't yell at the referees. Don't use profanity to your players. Don't do this. Whereas, like Hillary was mentioning, um, honoring the game is bigger than that. Um, honoring the game is almost like a coaching way of life where uh, we want to motivate, we want to inspire our players. It's kind of how we do business every single day. It kind of touches on culture, which we'll get to a little bit here. So, But thanks for the participation. Um, good answers, good conversation as well. So... Um, the roots that we're going to talk about is behavior to teach and to model to our players that we're coaching, okay? So obviously you figured out that roots is an acronym uh, because on the screen behind me it's listed in all capital letters, so there's your giveaway. But uh, roots stands for five different topics. So the first part is uh, the letter R, which stands for rules, and how we don't bend the rules to win. Uh, we need to respect the rules as coaches and teach that to our players that the rules are there as boundaries uh, to keep us safe and to ensure fair play. Now I have a friend of mine who is the college lacrosse coach and he's an assistant coach and he's specifically in charge of coaching his face-off players. So he has six guys that he coaches every single day and he told me a story that Last season, they all had a film session. They're watching film on their next opponent, and they're specifically watching the opponent face-off guy, and all of them are in the film noticed that the opponent on film was actually cheating. Now, I don't, I don't know how many of you are familiar with lacrosse, but a lot of cheating can, uh, can occur during a face-off, at least in the men's game, okay? Um, but they noticed this on film, and a couple of his players said, Hey, 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 coach. Uh, 32 is using his hands on every face-off. Why don't we do that in order to, to compete with him, in order to beat him? And uh, my colleague, the coach, stopped for a minute, stopped the tape, and he looked at him and he said, guys, I recruit you guys for your athletic ability, for what's up here, and for what's in here. I don't recruit people to come and cheat. So... He was honoring the game by respecting the rules. Next, we will go into the, the O, which would be opponents, and uh, realizing that a worthy opponent is a gift. It really is a gift that must be honored. Um, you know, I know, I know in our double goal coaching book, uh, the author talks about, can you imagine starting a tug of war and not having anyone on the other end of the rope? If we didn't have any opponents, we wouldn't really have a game. We wouldn't have any competition at all. You know, as a lacrosse coach, a former high school lacrosse coach, some of the fondest memories that I have of coaching are coaching against uh, PCA employee Rich Brzezinski. Um, 
his teams and my teams battled it out year after year after year. We knew every game was going to be a, a close battle, and win or lose, we lost close games to Rich's teams, and we won close games as well. But we honored each other. We respected each other. We didn't demonize each other as well. We held each other up. Um, I have a former youth player uh, that played a couple summers ago on a, a traveling team from Wisconsin, and they went to Long Island, New York, to play a lacrosse tournament. And his dad relayed a story to me that uh, any time a team from the Midwest goes out to Long Island, the kind of like the epicenter of lacrosse, you know you're in for, uh, for, for some tough games. So his son was a face-off player, and he, within three to four minutes of this game starting, his team was already down 7 to nothing. The other team's face-off guy was just a machine. Win, take it down, score seven times in a row. They walk up to the face-off X for the eighth face-off of the game. My player Will is his name, kind of dejected. He walks up, and the uh, face-off player on the other team walks up to him and looks right at Will in the eyes, and he said, I don't mean to sound cocky, but you're not going to beat my move. And he kind of paused, and Will looked back. He didn't even know how to react as a 15-year-old kid. And then the other player looked at him, and he said, but here's what you can do to slow me down. And he shared it with him real quick. Will's team ended up losing the game 12-1 to 1 or so, but they relayed a valuable lesson about respecting opponents and how even though there was a mismatch in talent right there that this winning, uh, this far superior player cared and respected enough about his opponent to share with him to help him battle to make it a more competitive game. So I thought that was a neat story. Okay, next, we're on to O for officials. We need to show respect to officials even when we disagree with them, even when we disagree with them. Have any of you ever been wrong? Anyone ever been wrong here before? All right, I didn't think so. But <laughs> I've been wrong. I've made poor coaching decisions. My players have been wrong before. Referees are going to be wrong, too. So we can just go over just a couple quick tools for your coaching toolbox um, that go with respecting and honoring our officials. And one is, the biggest one is... Communication. Good times to communicate. There's not so good times to communicate. Good maybe half time before a game, in between quarters, a timeout. Um, maybe having, in terms of how to communicate with referees, is having a more conversational tone versus an adversarial tone. Uh, just the tone of our questions. Asking questions to referee, saying, sir or ma'am, to a, a referee or umpire, um, can you help me understand what you saw during that slash call in the second quarter? Sounds a lot more disarming. So those are just some, a couple of tools. Um, there's obviously more in our, uh, in our workbook that we have as well. Um, and then educate yourself as well. Educate yourself on the rules. So one of the things I tell a referee, especially coaching youth lacrosse, is I'll start out and before a game starts, I'll talk to a referee and I'll say, I don't really care who wins this game right now. What I do care about is player safety and control the game. And I've had referees that stand there with blank looks on their faces because they've never heard a coach actually say that before uh, for, for recreational lacrosse, but um, I care deeply about that. So we'll move on to T, which is for teammates that – ensuring that our conduct is never embarrasses our teammates. Um, and this is really related to culture. Do any of you in the audience, coaches, you remember we talked about culture? You're timing me out. Yep, I'm timing you out. <laughs> Unless you want to finish your thought, okay. that was time. I don't want to cut you off mid-sentence. Okay, nice yeah, job. I'll, just go, I'll just go one more minute. Yeah. Go ahead. You can go one more minute. You can finish your thought. I'll go right to S. Right? We're wrapping up roots here with self. Uh, we want to live up to our own standards, even when other people don't live up to those standards as well. Um, I had a couple players, high school lacrosse players, who had a little issue with profanity, using it in a game outside of the ears of the referees, and I had to call them out on it after practice one day. And my players said, Coach, we play hockey, and in hockey, they don't care. 
And I had to look at them and say, I understand that, but our culture, the way we do things here, is that we don't tolerate profanity. We're going to live up to our own standards, regardless of what you did on your other team as well. So to wrap it up, um, if we really believe in honoring the game, we need to respect the roots of the game as well. And I had a coach tell me once, and I pass it along to you, is to, um, to be the coach that you wish you had. Be the coach you wish you had. Thanks a lot. Nice job. Thanks, Mark. All right. I'm writing down your last quote because I like that, and I'm going to steal it. <laughs> be the coach you wish you had. I like it. <laughs> I've heard that phrase oh, yeah. all different ways, and I like, I like that. All right. How did you feel about that, Mark? Um, honestly, it was just, I felt a little bit awkward, and the only reason I say that uh, is because presenting uh, double goal coach material with U.S. lacrosse uh, is a little bit, I want to say, same material, different sequence, and mm -hmm. different order. Mm -hmm. uh, than this, and that's still giving me, uh, I'm getting used to the flow and how much time to spend on what because uh, mm -hmm. it's just a little bit different, so I'm, I, I felt a little bit awkward. So, mm -hmm. apologize mm -hmm. for that. Yep, no, and I understand that. I spent last weekend at U.S. Lacrosse training in Baltimore, so I, I was looking at that going, that's strange, why do they have it in that order? So, I understand that it is a little different. But I think, I mean, I didn't notice that you were awkward with the order or things like that. You seemed to go very smoothly through it. So it wasn't obvious. Anyway. Um, all right. If we if you, uh, wouldn't mind, Hillary, maybe we can start with you with something that you really liked or a positive about Mark's workshop. Yeah, Mark, you know what? I didn't really notice awkwardness. I didn't feel it anyway. So I think that that is important for you to know. Um, I love your intro. I really enjoyed how smooth it was. I thought it was like really well prepared. You connected with me as a coach, and I think you really connect with your your uh, listeners with the parents thing. Like you really got me with that. Like parents is one of the biggest issues I deal with. I sometimes feel like I'm double tasking as a, a psychologist for the parents mm -hmm. and the children. Uh, so that was a huge sell. I was like, yes, teach me this. I want to learn. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Sean, how about you? Um, I really like the question of what's the difference between um, honoring the game and sportsmanship. I've never heard that used before, but I think that really will get coaches thinking, you know, about what the difference is and really the importance of honoring the game, you know, as opposed to just being a good sport. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you, Taylor. I love Thank you. your personal stories, Mark, and examples. Um, I specifically the one about the player that his dad told you about like the tournament and his experience out in Long Island because um, it's it's unique but it doesn't have to be a unique situation and so I love you sharing that. Um, I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. Great, thank, thank you. you. And Ruben? Um, I, uh, I'm gonna repeat, uh, I really liked the opening. I liked three pieces that you've combined into it the uh, just like you I'm a coach um, you, the, the, pulling in your law enforcement experience uh, trainer and connecting that to coaching I thought that was very effective and it was an, it's an attention getter I, I you know um, you're in law enforcement I think it gets people's attention and then um, the, the, the third piece uh, there um, that uh, you, you 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 got excited about double goal coaching positive coaching win I wrote down win, fun, performance, and getting parents to work with me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I really enjoyed the opening. And I, Kelly, I'm going to add one more because it's short and brief. Mm -hmm. um, respect for self, uh, you defined it clearly, and I think um, many trainers uh, miss out on that one. And you, 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 you stated it simply and clearly. Respect for yourself is living up to your own standards even when others don't. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm jotting that one down too. I, I'm stealing that one as well. Um, I think I think you did a lot of, of great things. I I personally loved your stories too. Um, I think that you have you're one of those people that has experience in all different areas, and you can tell that you are living this type of coaching. 
Um, sometimes it feels forced, like I'm just telling you what PCA does, but I can tell if you have a story for every every principle, that probably means that you've you've lived it and you're doing it. And you seem very convicted in the way that you coach, and that comes across to me as confidence, and I want to listen to you because I think, wow, he knows what he's doing, which is great. Um, I love the, the one of the first, not not your intro, but the quote about you know, I want parents to work with me, not against me. I thought that was a really powerful quote because that's the biggest issue. As Hillary said, that's an issue with all of us. And instead of saying, you know, I heard a lot of people say, oh, parents are so difficult. Parents are such a challenge. You've got those screaming parents. And they take it so negatively. And you did a nice job of saying, you know what, parents are, parents are a fact of life. And if you can get them to work with you, I mean, it just, it just made it a lot more positive than always. I hear a lot of venting about parents rather than let's make it productive use of parents. I thought that was great. Uh, the other thing that I really liked was how you stress teaching. You, like behavior is something you have to teach and model. Um, a lot of times when people present roots, they talk about this is what you have to do, not this is what you have to teach. And I think it was it's really important to stress that culture has to be taught and modeled, which is very important too. I think that was a subtle way of saying like you know coaches, you gotta watch you gotta watch what you do too. So I thought that was a really nice way to put that in. Um, and the last thing that I just, I, I wrote down a lot of quotes that you said, just a lot of one-liners, and I was like, wow, you just said that really well. And um, as I said, Joanna Lignelli from U.S. Lacrosse says, R&D, man, rip, rip off and duplicate. And I, I wrote down a lot of quotes that you said that I thought were really effective. So thank you for those. <laughs> All right, how about a uh, wish or, wishes you. or suggestions for Mark? What kind of comments or uh, suggestions, wishes could, could help Mark out a little bit? I'm going to sneak one more, one more positive in. I'm going to steal your mindset. I think that that's a great thing I can use in business, too. When someone's not paying attention in a meeting, to have them change their mindset, that was a great mm -hmm. thing. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I wish, and maybe as you get more comfortable with material, you can sneak in more participation. Like, let us play, too. And it's been a long day, and I'm at work, and I want to, I want to get up in action. So I like when you maybe stand up, and maybe more opportunity for people to participate. Mm -hmm. OK. Sean? Um, yeah, so. I know that you're part of U.S. Lacrosse and, and probably the CEP program, and I, I coach lacrosse and play lacrosse too, so I got all of those examples. If you ever do anything not lacrosse, you might want to you know, tone down the lacrosse-specific examples a little bit, and again, I don't know if you're going to be doing Little League, but I know one of, the, one of the problems that we have had before is people using a lot of examples from one main sport as opposed to kind of switching it up a little bit. Okay. There's two of you now. <laughs> I don't know how you did that, but you've duplicated yourself. That's that's pretty talented right there. Okay, <laughs> Taylor. Um, my I love when you reference the book twice, especially when you're referring to the the coach's toolkit. I think that's a a big key concept that every coach is gonna. That's why what we say is that if if a coach leaves a workshop getting one or two things that they're gonna implement into their how they coach, that's a successful workshop. And so I think. One one small detail is just to mention a page number that they can go to, that they can quickly like open your book, show that it's highlighted or something, so that they can just immediately have that reference and not have to. I mean, it's only ninety pages, but search through for it. They just have it right there. Mm -hmm. Great, good okay. suggestion. Thank you, Ruben. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to follow up on Hillary's comment about um, uh, steady interaction throughout. Uh, you know, let us play the, uh, the, throughout the, the, the workshop. Um, I, I think Roots is one, probably in the current Double Goal Coach One workshop, at least the PCA version, I think it's the, the, the biggest trap for the trainer to uh, get away from interaction. Because you, you, know, you got this laundry list of five things, and you want to explain them all, you want to give an example. So, um, uh, I, I, I liked, I actually stepped away, but I saw that during officials, you asked a question, and I saw Hillary raise her hand enthusiastically. So you 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 threw in a question at that point. Can you hear me, Mark? He's trying on his phone. Uh, Mark, can you hear me? Not so much. A little, little bit. Can, yeah, can the others can't hear remember. me? Now, I now can't you remember. can. Okay. Okay. Yes, so, can. so so Mark, I was uh, adding on to Hillary about. Uh, <laughs> keeping interaction throughout and uh, I mentioned that I think Roots is a place in the in our current workshop where it's it's the biggest trap for a trainer to to uh, not create the the interaction you know because you got those five things 
You want to explain them all. You want to give an example for all of them. Although I don't know that you have to give an example for all of them. Um, I noticed, uh, even though I stepped away from the phone, that when you got to respect for officials, you must have asked a question because people were laughing. Hillary was enthusiastically raising her hand. I missed the question, but I like the fact that you threw in a question at that point. Um, Has I, anyone I ever been wrong? That was his question. Oh, okay. All right. It, I, I knew it uh, triggered laughter and a strong response. So, um, you know, some trainers don't like doing this, um, but one way is... Um, and the PowerPoint is set up where you can do this. Instead of telling us what each letter stands for, you can say, what do you think the R stands for? Respect for. And, and it's, it's low-level interaction, but it, it just breaks up your voice uh, you know, with, with a question. So, um, and, then, uh, you know, and then other things you can do, again, um, you can ask questions. As part, you can ask rather than tell. So you told us the, the function of the rules, safety and fairness, but you can ask us, what, what function are the rules supposed to, to serve? And, and so you'll get the same response. You'll get the right. same idea brought up, but it'll be, you'll be tapping into the group. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Hey, Mark, fantastic. And, and I, I, I want to echo what, <laughs> again, I feel like I'm uh, echoing Hillary a lot. Uh, you mentioned that you felt a little awkward. Boy, you did not seem awkward at all. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very smooth and poised. And what, it, if it was, it, what, what a talent for you if you were feeling it a little inside, not to have it conveyed to us. Very well done. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. I think it's interesting because we've had a lot of a lot of people that go through this training course that do not present often. This might be the first time that they're actually presenting in front of an audience. Um, you and, and Tucker was the other person today, Tucker White, that said, this is really awkward for me because you seem like the kind of person that can really feed off of a live audience and this isn't yeah. that format. So I think that's probably why you felt awkward because you've done this so many times in front of a live audience that this is weird. But um, yeah. I, as I said, I thought, I thought it seemed very smooth. I only had um, two things that, that were not mentioned. I think I do agree with what everybody said. Um, because I'm the timekeeper, I kind of keep track of pace. Obviously, you know the importance of interaction. Your activity where you have a stand up and, and walk around, I've seen that duplicated from other U.S. lacrosse trainers that have given you credit for it. So I think that's a great activity. Mm -hmm. But right after that, you said um, the difference between sportsmanship and honoring the game. And I, I think I agree with what Ruben says. Keeping interaction more interspaced without, because, you know, when you start, I do a down clock, so I start at 15 minutes and then you know, for the first six minutes, we didn't have any interaction at all. It was all you talking. And then, you know, between like nine minutes and five minutes left was all the interaction. And then from five minutes left to the end, there was no interaction again. So okay. just somehow to space that out, I think, would just keep us, keep us more engaged. Right. Um, and the only, the only other thing that I had was um, your stories, I think, are excellent. I agree with Sean that I think if you, there's a lot of workshops that we do that are 100% Little League or 100% basketball. And, I, you know, I have learned so many football examples because I've never played it and soccer examples and lacrosse examples and you just have to be able to pull in examples from other sports or if you don't have them, ask the audience for them. You know, and I've said before, I've never played football. Can you give me an example of where you would use an effort goal in football? Um, and, I, and I totally play like the, not that you could do it, but I, I always say I play like the dumb blonde sometimes. And I just say, I, I'm sorry, I'm clueless about football. Can you help me understand this? And coaches are usually like, yeah, it's great. I had to do a workshop one time for squash. I'm like, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. I have no idea even what the rules of squash are, but I'm not here to teach you about that. I'm here to teach you about how to coach. So I think it's just, it's a good way to get interaction. It's a good way to kind of humble yourself to go, you, you are my resource. Help me figure this out. Right. So, but I think, and again, your stories were excellent. You might want to just shorten some of them down slightly, okay. um, because there were so many of them that they kind of they kind of kind of blurred together. And usually, when you tell a story, I really remember it, and I remember probably two of them, but I don't specifically remember all of them because I think there was just one after the other. But I oh. think you did a fantastic job. I I would want to come to your workshop. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Hillary and um and Mark, we're gonna we kind of have a chance to debrief here for a few minutes and then um, if you guys you guys are welcome to go and I will be in touch with both of you. You both did a fantastic job. We're really we're really proud of everything that you did and uh, really excited. We will be in touch. Um, I'll probably reach out to you guys tomorrow morning just to kind of let you know what we debriefed and, uh, and what we can do for your next steps to get you out there in front of coaches. Well, thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to do this. Absolutely. Great.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye bye. Yep, bye. All right, take care. Yep.